Hey everyone, this is Rohan with BestEconTutor.com and today we'll be talking about imports and gains from trade, tariffs and import quotas, and exports. So first let's talk about imports and gains from trade. Here's the thing. It's kind of important to understand the assumptions that go on here because there's a lot of assumptions here that are not true in the real world. So part of the assumptions are that there are uh, no shipping costs, that there are no barriers to entry of course, but there's also no quality difference between an American product and a foreign product or something like that. There's also no country loyalty. So basically what this boils down to is if you are an American consumer and if you have to choose between something that costs $4 in America or $3.99 from China, you'd rather get the Chinese item because it's cheaper and you don't care about uh, which country you're buying it from and the quality is the same and there's no shipping costs and all that stuff, right? So those are the assumptions that go on here. So as a consequence, let's see what would happen when this is the market for cars, let's say 100 cars are being sold in America for $20,000 each. Now, the weird thing is this, usually in most, in most uh, of everything we've seen so far, this point over here where the supply and demand intersect, that is the best possible point. That's where there is no deadweight loss. As we'll see here, there actually is gonna be deadweight loss over here. But, Let's, uh, let's go step by step. So let's see, let's say you're at this, mar at this point in the market right now where 100 cars are sold for $20,000 each. Now what if the world price, meaning the price everywhere else other than America, is $15,000? So we can represent that by you know, a horizontal line just saying the world price is $15,000. Now here's the thing, let's think carefully if, if we now open up our borders to free trade, what would happen? Well, if you're an American consumer, you're thinking, hey, should I buy a $20,000 American car or a $15,000 car from somewhere else in the world? Well, again, based on our assumptions, you'd rather buy the $15,000 car. So here's the thing. A common misconception is that in this market, some cars will be sold in America for $20,000 and some will be sold from the rest of the world for $15,000. But that's not the case. Every car has to be sold for $15,000, even the American cars. Here's why, because if you're an American producer here, and if you decided to keep your price at 20,000, which is what it was before you opened up to trade, well then, you're gonna sell exactly zero cars because none of your customers wanna buy it from you. They'd rather import every single car. So, just to even match that, you have to lower your price to 15. So that's a key assumption that is going on over here is, as soon as we open ourselves up to free trade, the producer's price gets lowered down to 15 as well. So this old, equilibrium price becomes totally irrelevant. Now let's think about what happens to producer surplus. So the producer surplus, it used to be everything below 20 and above the supply curve, but now, again, they're only getting 15 per car, so the new producer surplus is actually only this much. So this is the new producer surplus. And now let's think about what happens to consumer surplus. Oh, and one thing is, notice that instead of 100, they're only making 50 cars now because that's their supply. If the price is only 15, they only want to make 50 cars because they'd, you know, they'd only sell the other 50 cars if the price was more, you know, because it cost them, because the supply again is the MC curve. So why would they not want to sell the 51st car? Well, it costs them more than 15,000 to make it, but they can only sell it for 15. So they'd make a loss if they sold it, right? That's why they want to stop producing at 50 cars. So, but now let's see what happens to the consumers. The consumers now, sit on their just looking into the demand curve, at a price of 20, they wanted 100 cars, but now that they can buy cars for 15, they want even more than 20, right? They want 130 cars now. So they're gonna end up buying 130 cars, but here's a question. If only 50 are made at home, but the consumers want 130, how are they gonna get the remaining 80 cars? Well, they're gonna import them. So that gap is called imports. What would have been a shortage if this 15 were a price ceiling, which you can go back to the module for price controls if you need to review that, but 
what would have been a price, uh, what would have been a short edge under a price ceiling is actually now what you import. It's not that it's a short edge anymore. You can get it from the rest of the world. So you import the remaining 80 cards. It's really just that gap. And so then if we want to find the consumer surplus, it's everything below the demand curve and above 15. It used to just be everything above 20. It used to be this area, but now they're, they're only paying 15, so they have more consumer surplus, and they're buying more cars. So the CS is now all this, this whole region. So let's think about data weight loss. Usually for data weight loss, we look at, all right, originally you were here, your total surplus was CS plus PS was that big triangle. And then we look at, all right, well, what's it now? And it's something less, and however much less it is, that's the dead weight loss. But now here, we actually have more than what we originally did, right? So what is it, do we call this? We have exactly this much more, right? Compared to what we, we used to only have this much. And now we have that much plus this much. So is that a dead weight gain? Well, we not, not really. What we, the way we phrase it is that we sort of recalibrate. Instead of this being the optimal point with no dead weight loss, this now, our equilibrium with total free trade, this is the point with no dead weight loss. So if you have total free trade and you let your customers buy 130 cars for 15,000 each, uh, well, then, then you have no data weight loss. So in fact, here, if you were to ban trade somehow, so even if the world price were 15, but if you ban trade, if you force them to be at the domestic equilibrium where this is CS and this is PS, well, then this much would be your data weight loss because that's how much more you could have if you opened yourself up to trade. So here, if you are at this point, the name for that is autarky. It's a weird word, but some books and professors use it. But autarky is just if you're not trading at all, if you're you know, blocking yourself off from the rest of the world and only restricting yourself to that domestic equilibrium. All right, now let's talk about tariffs and import quotas. So here's the thing. Why even bother having the government get involved in this market? Well, here's the thing. Let's say you're the government. You're kind of, you're kind of split between two things. Here's the thing. If you were to you know, let total free trade happen. On the one hand, it's good because, hey, you have no dead weight loss if you allow total free trade in your country, right? But the bad thing is the producer surplus. Look how small it is. If you were to ban trade and force them to be at this equilibrium, the PS would be much larger, right? And here's the thing. So even though there's more total surplus over here, there's less producer surplus. And, you know, producer surplus, I mean, it might just seem like a number on, on a graph over here, but Really what it is, is it's how well your businesses are doing, the businesses in your country. And if they're not doing that well, well then that's gonna in turn affect the workers because then they're gonna lay off people and more jobs are gonna go abroad and whatnot. So if you are the government of a country, you're probably split between should I let free trade happen and then have my consumers enjoy all this surplus or should I ban trade and then at least that way my producers are doing better and then they're gonna in turn give people more jobs in my country and whatnot. So you're kind of split. So, you know, should you ban trade? Well, then the issue is, yeah, sure, your PS goes up, but then you have all this dead weight loss, right? Because you're losing out on that big triangle. But if you do this, you have this small PS, so it's too, super tiny. So there is a compromise. The compromise is a tariff. And as we'll see, equivalently, an import quota. But first, let's talk about a tariff. So here's what a tariff is. It's when the government says <clears throat> to the consumer, Hey, American car consumer, if you want to buy a car from abroad, you totally can, but you have to give me, your government, $2,000. So, if that's the case, let's look at how that affects this market. Well, if you're an American consumer of cars, you're, you know, you're able to buy cars for $15,000 at this point because of the free world uh, trading. But now, for you, the cost is really $17, right? Because you also have to pay $2,000 to your government. So it's as if the world price is 17,000. This is the world price with the tariff. So now, now that it's 17,000, you are demanding fewer, let's say now you're only demanding 110 cars instead of 130 cars. But now here's the thing. The $2,000 only applies if you were to get the car from abroad. So, technically, the producers at home, they can actually sell you the car for 17 now because here's the thing. Ideally, 
the producers at home, wanted to sell you the car for 20. The only reason they had to lower their price to 15 in the first place was because that's what your alternative was, right? If they priced it anything higher than 15, you wouldn't have bought it from them because you can import them for 15. But now your next best alternative is 17, right? So they're just gonna price their cars at 17 so that you'll still buy some from them. So now, so the producer surplus will go up. So the tariff helps the producers because their producer surplus now is gonna include this area as well because it's now everything underneath 17 instead of just underneath 15. So this area is the increase in PS with the tariff. So out of the two goals that you had, you know, raising the PS and not having a lot of deadweight loss, you at least have more producer surplus, so yay. Now let's look, look at deadweight loss. Well, let's see. Over here, let's say this is 70 or something. Well now, at this price of 17, you're still gonna import cars because at 17, the producers at home are making 70, but the consumers want 110, so you're gonna import the remaining 40 cars. So there's that, but let's look at what the consumer surplus is. The consumer surplus, it goes down, right? Because it used to be everything above 15, now it's everything above 17 because that's the price consumers face, 17. So this is the new consumer surplus. So if you look at the CS and PS, it looks like, you know, our dead weight loss, it's not quite this big triangle. It's, it's only, it looks like it's this trapezoid, right? Because that's how much we uh, lost compared to when we had total free trade, when this was our CS and this was our PS, you know, compared to that. Now we have this CS and this new PS. So it looks like we lost that much, which is, you know, better than losing all this if we were to ban trade. But the thing is, we've done even better than that because remember, part of the total surplus is the government's revenue. So not all this is deadweight loss because we are getting some of it back. Well, the government is, right? So at least somebody's getting it. It's not a deadweight loss. So how much is the government actually getting? Well, they're getting a t the tariff. They're getting 2,000, right? For how many cars? Only the imported ones. And how many are imported? 40. So the government's getting 2,000 each for 40 cars. So, you know, 2,000 times 40, which you can, technically that's this rectangle. This rectangle over here, the height is, you know, the gap between these two world price lines is the $2,000 tariff times this, the new imports, 2,000 times 40. So that is a part of your total surplus. So you have this, you have the CS and you have the PS. So the only things that we are missing that we no longer have is this triangle and this triangle. These two triangles then are the deadweight loss when we impose a tariff. Now equivalently, instead of having this $2,000 tariff and you know, PS went up, so the producers are happy, CS went down, government got some money, but there's still a little bit of a deadweight loss because there could have been a higher total if you had total free trade. But equivalently, you'd get the exact same end result if you were to have a quota, an import quota of 40 cars. If you were to say that you're only allowed to import 40 cars from abroad, then what you want to do is you want to find where exactly is the gap 40? Where will uh, the free market want to import 40 cars? Well, in this case, it turns out at a price of 17. So in that case, what happens is the there's this thing called the quota holders because if you're only allowed to import 40 cars, well, how do you determine who, uh, who, who are the producers that get to sell the 40 cars? Well, whoever they are, it's, there's many different ways it could be assigned, but however it's assigned, whoever those 40 people are, they now get to charge 17 instead of 15. So they're making, instead of the government making it, it's the quota holders that make this. But either way, it's still the same. This is now the PS, this is the CS, this goes to somebody, either the government or the quota holders, but either way, the dead weight loss is the same. It's that much. So now let's look at exports. Exports will happen when the world price is actually above your domestic equilibrium price. So in that case, let's see. Let's say that the world price is $25,000 for cars and that the domestic price is $20,000 for cars. So what happens is now, if you're a producer in America, you're thinking, hey, rather than selling even some cars for only $20,000, I can sell as many cars as I want for $25,000. Again, that's a part of the assumptions that we make. So what that means is you're just going to set your price at $25,000, whether you're selling it to people at home or customers abroad. So $25,000, 
that's a new, that's the world price. So the suppliers are going to sell at that price. So at twenty five thousand, it looks like one hundred and thirty. So you're going to want to sell one hundred and thirty cars uh, more than you did when the price was only twenty. That you wanted to sell one hundred. But now, if you're a consumer at home, you're also going to face a price of twenty five, right? So one theme here is whatever the world price is, the domestic price when you're engaging in trade will will end up having to match that. The original equilibrium doesn't mean anything anymore. So at a price of 25, the consumers at home, though, the demand, if you look at the demand curve, the consumers only want to buy 50 cars. And now let's look at their consumer surplus. Instead of everything above uh, 20, it used to be all this. Now it's only this much. Now it's only everything above 25. That's the new CS. So they're worse off, clearly, whenever the world price is higher and you're exporting. Uh, notice it was the opposite with the imports. With the imports, the producers were worse off and when the because the price went down to match the world price. And now let's look at the producer surplus. It used to be this much, right? It used to just be everything below 20 and above the supply curve, but now it's everything below 25 and above the supply curve. So now it goes up by this much. So the new PS is really this much. That's a PS and um, that's a CS. So notice over here, if you were to somehow ban trade and be an autarky again, you're going to have deadweight loss because in that case, your surplus would only be this much. So you'd have this much of a deadweight loss if you were an autarky. And if you were here now, if you were to let free trade happen, even though the consumers are worse off, you have no deadweight loss because that's when the total is the highest because then all this would be PS if you were here. So now let's look at some questions from students. First question is, what happens when the world price is equal to the domestic equilibrium price? Great question. Now, we've talked about, you know, if the world price is below and you engage in free trade, there's going to be imports. And if it's above, there's going to be exports. And in either case, there's a deadweight loss if you were to stay at your domestic equilibrium. But what if the world price was exactly at 20? Well, in that case, even if you were to, you know, try to engage in, you know, importing or exporting, well, the price is the same here or abroad naturally anyways. So here's the thing. At a price of 20, the demand here is 100, but the supply at home is also 100. So there's actually no need to import or export. So the short answer is, if the world price is equal to the domestic equilibrium price, there simply will be no importing or exporting, and there's also no deadweight loss when you're over here because that's the best you can do. Now another question. Are there always gains from trade? Well, as we just saw, the one case where there are no gains from trade is when the world price equals the domestic price, but otherwise, yes, there are gains for somebody from trade. That doesn't mean that everyone benefits. So as we saw with importing, when the world price is lower, the producers are actually worse off. But there are overall gains from trade because the consumers are more better off. There's you know, more total surplus whenever there's you know, either importing or exporting going on. Well, I hope you now understand economics better. And if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning customized platform at bestecontutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. And we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.